Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sean Hosepian. Uh, I am going to talk about what's so special about BI on big data. But before I do that, I want to thank uh, Bloomberg and First Mark Capital, who have always been very gracious hosts. I want to thank my co-presenters, who are probably the best-looking bunch of presenters we've ever had on stage here, I'd like to think. Um, and sort of to echo what Matt has been saying, I want to thank all of you in the audience. I, my first, back then it used to be called something much less cool, NYC Data Business Meetup. Uh, number seven was my first one. So like a lot of you, I, I've been in the audience for a lot of these things. I've set up very elaborate Gmail filters to send me an SMS as soon as the Meetup email came in because you know there's like that narrow four minute window where you can actually not be stuck on the wait list. Um, and Matt, I think over and over again, he talks about this Meetup isn't just about big data, it's also about entrepreneurship. So the first time I was in attendance here, I had a boring job at a very big company and now I have a not boring job at a very tiny company that I got to co-found. So it's, it's really been great for me. I've uh, you know, I've seen some amazing talks. I've learned a lot. I've met venture capitalists here. I've, I've made friends out there over beer and really bad pizza. Uh, I've really uh, learned a lot from this community. And I think all of us are very fortunate uh, to have it. So you know, I want to especially thank uh, Matt for having me here. Uh, uh, and not to press the wrong button, sorry. Um, so yeah, so you know, Matt, I don't know how he finds the time to do it. Matt's really great. Uh, Former colleague of Matt's actually did a great job of comparing Matt to the, you know, the busiest man in show business, uh, Siobhan. Siobhan said Matt is the French Ryan Seacrest of big data. <laughs> However, that hashtag did not catch on. I think I think it was a little too long. So for Siobhan's sake and especially Matt's sake, if anyone here is going to post a picture or do a tweet, I encourage you to add. Come on. Hashtag big data Seacrest, as well as hashtag data driven NYC. So this is why you didn't want to send the slides in advance? This is why I made sure not to send the slides in advance. Um, I also had to uh, artificially give you a tan. It was like a serious problem <laughs> with this photo compared to Ryan. But they do, right? You know, ladies and gentlemen, they do look alike. Um, all right. That just set like sort of the theme for the rest of this talk. Um, so. I'm the CTO, and uh, this shade of gray doesn't look great here, but I apologize. CTO and co-founder of Arcadia Data. Sort of our founding vision was create business value from big data. That was generic enough that we could kind of do whatever we wanted and still claim that we we're sticking to our vision. Um, so we came out of stealth mode in June, and we just announced the GA release of our product. Uh, been rapidly growing, and we're definitely focused on the Fortune 200. So we see a lot of customers who are struggling with data, big and small. And um, what I'm going to sort of try to talk about today, a lot of these you know, NYC data-driven talks are supposed to be less promotional and more informative. So I'm going to do my best to sort of talk about what we've been seeing in the field, what our customers complain about. And in particular, I'm going to try to answer your, um, a question around BI on big data. Specifically, you, know, you don't use previous generation architectures to store your big data. So why should you use previous generation BI tools for your big data? Um, so we're very fortunate in the big data community because we have a celebrity, Big Data Borat. For those of you who are not familiar with Big Data Borat, Big Data Borat is you know, the spokesperson of the big data community. Uh, you all just learned about Big Data Seacrest, right? Um, and what I'm going to try to do today is I'm going to channel Big Data Moses. Um, I'm going to try to talk about the Ten Commandments for BI on big data. Um, and I'm going to sort of paraphrase uh, Mike Olson about a year ago. By the way, you know, I just realized it's kind of, I feel special too, because this is data-driven NYC number 42. So for those of you who know, 42 is just a very special number. And I just realized that that's kind of cool. Um, sorry. So Mike Olson, who co-founder of Cloudera, chief strategy officer, when he was up here, he kind of said something in regard to Oracle. I'm going to paraphrase, but he said, Oracle gives you uh, min, max, median on tabular data, and it's a $100 billion industry. And you know, we do advanced analytics on 1,000 times that data, and I feel like it's got to be worth more than that, right? Um, and then in response to that, he said, hey, I've invested a lot in this industry, so everything I say will be self-serving. So I'm going to try really hard not to say things that are self-serving, but you know, my Ten Commandments will be partially biased. So 
let me just give you that caveat from now. And, OK, so commandment number one, thou shalt not move big data. Uh, I think this one is sort of speaks for itself. It's kind of obvious, but moving big data is expensive. By nature, it is big. So you know, just physics right, are in play there. Um, so when you're kind of what we've been seeing in the field and the customers have been talking to, people want BI tools that can push down as much computation as close to the data as possible, right? So there are lots of, we're very fortunate now, uh, Hadoop, Big Data, Mongo, Cassandra, the industry has really, really, really developed a lot. And we have a lot of amazing native tools that you can use for analytics. So you, when you're out there looking for a BI tool, make sure there's a BI tool that can leverage um, analytics as close to the data as possible. And don't just settle for ODBC, JDBC connectors, right? Um, that's kind of something that everyone will claim, but really try to go below that layer and see if you can get some real native analytics uh, from your BI tool. So be careful having to extract data out into data marts and cubes. Uh, an extract is by definition moving. So moving big data, you know, again, expensive, big, complicated. It's also a huge maintenance problem. So a lot of customers we talk to don't want to you know, forget about the network performance or the CPU computation, right? It's just a management overhead of now there are two copies of something that's logically the same. Uh, so if you do have to do extracts and cubes with your BI tool, it would be great if they can do them in situ. So you know, if you're using Mongo, a lot of the cool analytics tools for Mongo these days will create Mongo documents directly. If you're doing anything on Hadoop, try to make sure that cube or extract actually resides on the Hadoop cluster instead of a separate system. Um, and then the thing that I'm sort of most excited about is on cluster BI. So on cluster BI is something that's possible now. Thanks to things like Yarn, Mesos, we're seeing a whole new resurgence of operating systems for the data, for the data center. So I, you know, I have built an application that lives on a data center, right? I didn't have to write replication. I didn't have to implement a scheduler. I got all of these services. So it has made application development much easier. And kind of think about the possibilities of your big data system of how much BI you can actually push down to the lower layers. Um, OK, second commandments. Thou shall not steal or violate corporate security policy. Um, I, I'm sort of biased. I'm here in New York, so I talk to a lot of companies who are very, very serious about security, especially given the last few sets of data breaches. Um, every customer I talk to is really worried about Sentry or about security. Excuse me. So, um, you know, a lot of the serious big data vendors, we were fortunate enough to have one of them speaking later today, have really heard this from their customers, and they've implemented some amazing infrastructure to make security a possibility. But as the kind of the theme with big data is, it's large and it's complicated. So when you're looking for BI tools, you want to look for BI tools that can leverage the security model that's already in place. Um, if you have to sort of re-implement your whole security model, you know, once in your storage layer, once in your database layer, and once in your application BI layer, you're, you're not going to do it, right? You're going to lose information. So look for unified security models. There have been a lot of great projects. Um, Hortonworks has done a great job. IBM is working on uh, Knox. Mongo has an amazing Mongo. Who would have thought? But Mongo has this amazing security architecture now that your applications can plug into, propagate that user information all the way up to the application layer, and enforce you know, this visualization and the data lineage associated with it along the way. And then auditing. right? If you can't get security and you can't get encryption, at least make sure there's an audit trail for your applications. Because you know, when Edward Snowden hits, you want to know where he hit. right? This is the consensus that we're seeing a lot more of. Next commandment. Um, thou shall not pay for every user or gigabyte. So kind of one of the fundamental beauties of big data, besides the types of analytics and the storage, you know, it's hard to deny at the end of the day there's an economic advantage. Big data is cost effective if done properly, right? You wouldn't stick five petabytes of data in your Oracle system because it would just cost you so much money, but you can sort of put it in a big data system. So when you're looking for BI tools, make sure your BI tools don't um, penalize you for your big data, right? So um, pricing models that penalize you for increased adoption are kind of dangerous, right? Traditionally, we'd see lots of applications. You know, Oracle loves to charge you by core. Uh, lots of applications charge you by gigabytes. Some applications charge you by gigabyte indexed. And you know, these are very frightening concepts when you're dealing with big data because it's very common to have uh, geometric, you know, I'm not going to say exponential, logarithmic. You can have some really fast growth, both from the data side and the adoption side. And the beauty of a lot of these systems is incremental scalability. So we've had multiple customers who, within a couple of months, have had deployments go from you know, 
I'm going to say like tens of billions of entries to hundreds of billions, right? They went from having 12 active users on the system to 600, right? So you want to make sure that your BI tools sort of business motives and your business motives are aligned. Just because an application or a use case gets a lot of adoption, you know, it's very easy to incrementally scale these systems, but you want to make sure you're not paying a penalty on the BI side of having to pay too much money for having uh, too many gigabytes indexed, which is like a very frightening concept. Okay, next. Uh, thou shalt covet thy neighbor's visualizations. Um, so first class support for collaboration. Again, big data, complicated. You know one person in your organization will know everything, right? You will have domain experts, but really it's all about letting people work together to come up with insights. I'm gonna differentiate publish and share here. So publish, like, you know, static PDFs, export to PNG, send to email servers. We also want a way to sort of publish these visualizations that preserve their interactivity so they're not just static. So always important to look for those features, but also contrast that with sharing. When I think of sharing, I think of the GitHub model, right? Where it's not, here's your final published product, but here is clone it, fork it, and this is how I derive that those insights so other people can learn from those insights. And, and that's really important, again, in the big data space because sort of one form of analytics can be applicable to different problem domains. Um, thou, this one's my favorite, thou shalt analyze thine data in its natural form, just because it was hard to say. Um, so this is what big data looks like. If, this is literally what big data looks like because this is the Wikipedia article about big data. But you know, big data is free-form text, paragraphs. You may want to do search here, faceting, some simple aggregation. Um, my friends in finance, anyone should be able to recognize this. This is the fixed data format. This is you know, what finance and sensors look like. It's a bunch of key value pairs, right? And there's tons and tons of this that gets generated. This is JSON, probably the trendiest data format of all, but sort of semi-structured, multi-structured data where um, things like JSON, Avro, Parquet have made these possibilities. Mongo, right? Mongo has made a huge bet on making sure data should stay in this format, and not just for a performance scalability reason, but because there's an extra bit of expressiveness here that you just can't do if you convert the data into this next format, which are tables, which everyone knows and loves. Um, you know, this is big data too. There's lots of just straight tabular data that exists in the big data world. The difference is, you know, there's hundreds of billions or trillions of these. They have lots of columns. You'll still have to do lots of relational joins. So you know, don't let your BI solution tell you otherwise. Right? You want to find the BI solution that won't tell you, hey, sorry, please transform your data into a pretty table. You want BI solutions that can really analyze the data in its native form because there is value for having data in that form. I've lost count, but thou shalt not wait endlessly for thine results. This one, um, no surprise here. Right? Things should be fast. Data is big, so you, know, you shouldn't have to wait too long. So, Bunch of dirty tricks, you know, ah, not dirty, but tricks BI tools have always played to achieve performance, right? First one is build an OLAP cube. This actually works really well. The problem is you have to build a cube before you get performance. Um, and going back to one of the earlier commandments, try not to move the data. So you know, we'll see lots of tools that encourage you to build BI cubes or OLAP cubes, and you'll get good performance. Creating temp tables, so I'll sort of call this fancy caching, but lots of BI tools will like during the session to materialize the intermediate results and the expression so you don't have to do those calculations over and over again. Again, this actually works pretty well. Um, just make sure that temp table isn't gigantic and your laptop isn't going to crash because it's trying to materialize it locally. Um, I'm sorry, last point, samples. So you know, sampling of data can be dangerous. You get instant gratification, but your results may not be correct. So look for tools that sort of can sample intelligently. Certain types of analytics require blocking operation, right? At certain points in the analysis, I need to stop and count everything. So you need to be able to push that sampling down below that and not above it. Otherwise, the only things you'll be able to sample are trivial visualizations. Thou shalt not build reports, but apps instead. Um, so what comes to mind when I say reports? Traffic report, weather report, book report, report card. Uh, none of these things are pleasant, right? Just don't, you know, you don't want to deal with reports. Uh, if you're Alex Dumphy from Modern Family, you, you like reports. But that's about it. Um, what comes to mind when I say apps? Sunshine and rainbows, obviously, right? Apps are just so much cooler now, so it's better to sort of build apps. Um, I'll try to sort of explain by what we mean by apps, but there's this kind of, um, in 1996, Ben Schoenerman and his grad students published an Infosys paper about visual information seeking mantra. That was a team that went to build Spotfire. I think it's been 20 years, and it's still very relevant, but the general theme for data analysis was overview, 
zoom and filter, then details on demand. I think nothing has fundamentally changed there. All that is very relevant and important for big data analytics. You just need a tool that can sort of do that in an expressive, interactive way. I'm not going to make the tired analogy of iPhones and apps, but I'm going to sort of try to talk about web apps. You know, everyone likes to talk about this. But you want your BI, you know, you want data-driven apps. And what that means from a BI perspective, I'm going to kind of do an analogy from what happened with web apps. Asynchronous data from multiple sources. So I don't, I don't have to refresh something. I don't have to wait for something to reload. I can get data really quickly. Um, interact with visual elements, not text boxes. Who here is familiar with D3? Can I just get hands? Uh, just keep them up. Put it down if you've never heard of the data join. OK, so that's, that's still pretty good. So D3 became awesome because not that it created this great visual interface in the JavaScript library, but it decoupled the relationship between the data and how it's visualized and how um, the actual elements in the, in the DOM and how they map. So now people who don't want to click on menus and play with parameters, they want to actually interact with the visual elements to get the results they want. And I think the third thing that's really important, what made web apps popular was frameworks like Rails that made it easy to develop. So, you know, just because a visualization tool or a BI tool can give you interactive visualizations, you know, it's important to think about the developer side first as well, right? Rails really made it easy for a bunch of people to build web applications. Um, and you'd want similar functionality from your app, templates, reusability, things like that. I'm out of time, so I'm going to go really fast. Um, thou shalt use intelligent tools. So again, big data is big, big data is complicated. So look for smart BI tools. BI tools have been doing a great job now of recommending visualizations based on the data, based on usage. Look for tools that have search built in for everything because you know, I've seen customers who literally have thousands of visualizations they've built out. You need a way to quickly look for results and we've been trained to search as opposed to go through menus these days. So search is a built in feature. Um, and then any kind of automatic maintenance of models and sort of caching where the end user didn't have to worry about it. Um, thou shalt go beyond the basics. So we have giant big data systems. They have amazing horsepower for predictive analytics. Uh, our next speaker, actually, his company has done an amazing job at this type of technology. We're making advanced analytics accessible to business users. And you, know, you can run this R function isn't the right answer. The answer is what matters for business users, correlation, forecasting these things, making them very easy to use. And the last commandment, Thou shalt use Arcadia data. No. <laughs> Just kidding. I couldn't think of 10. So next time I do this talk, I'll have 10. But seriously, if any of this sounded interesting to you guys, um, check us out. We just we did Series A. We just came out of stealth mode. Um, we're a converged analytics platform. We're all about making BI for big data um, a reality. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Lots of uh, wisdom here. You went over time, but since you spent the first two or three minutes talking about me, I felt bad about <laughs> This is where you get payback, and I'm a little worried. Um, no, so uh, very interesting. Lots of, uh, lots of wisdom again. Um, and since you kindly did not turn this into a promotional uh, conversation, so actually tell us a bit more about what you guys do and what's uh, unique. Thank you, Matt. Um, what we do and what's unique. Um, I think actually what we do is a lot of what we've seen there. The, the sort of catharsis for our company was um, like I used to work at a very big data company and just seeing our customers struggle and the economics and you know at the end of the day the company's sort of incentives weren't aligned with the customer's incentives. So we wanted to sort of build a platform that made sense. Hey, your data is in this form. I'm not going to charge you extra for transforming it. Let's just let you analyze it in this form. Your data lives in this system. I'm not going to make you move it to another system. So kind of just you know, making those simple things easy for the business users so they can get value from their data without having to kind of suffer and struggle through what some of the existing vendors were forcing people to do. Great, and many things were super interesting. Um, the, the, the bit about the, um, the pricing model, uh, how, how do you guys charge, I guess, uh, to avoid that problem of uh, having a price that's scales or that scares people when there's yeah, too much so, data? So typically from the BI space, you would see pricing models around uh, named seats, licenses, like who, how many versions of the software there are, how much data we're indexing, or you know, how many instances of our OLAP server you have to purchase. Uh, what we've been doing, it's what well for our customers, is aligning with how they buy their big data system. So if they're a Hadoop vendor, if they're a cloud server, 
uh, or if they're using big data on the cloud, you know, they're used to utility billing or they're used to you know, purchasing things per node in a subscription model. So we very much try to align to that. We don't penalize you for named users. We don't penalize you for embedding, but concurrent users, right? So the things, the functionality and the features that are sort of a technological burden on us, concurrency is, is a big deal. So we try to sort of bill um, on that. So lots of people can still have access and use it, but when it's in production and there are SLAs, that's when you want to sort of figure out how to invoice your customers. Okay, great. Um, we have time for one or two questions. The uh, excellent Andrew over there from First Mark has a mic. Hi, thanks. So I'm interested. As an early stage company, are there specific areas of functionality that you had to focus on uh, in order to get out to market where there were, you know, op unmet needs, opportunities that larger BI providers? weren't uh, serving, or was it important to come with a full-featured slide? Yeah, so that's actually always tricky. That's I think the hardest part about starting a small company is you need to figure out what the pain points are, right? There's maybe, you know, customers will have 10 pain points. You need to solve as many of those as you can. But when you're building technology that has a legacy industry in place, like we do BI, has been around for, you know, 30 some odd years, there's a lot of checkbox features that you need to develop. So you have to really find the right balance. And a lot of times that means saying no to specific customers. But we've focused on um, you know, things related to making using big data systems, Hadoop specifically, easier. Um, you know, doing analytics and data in its natural form and some advanced analytic capabilities that we found were the real pain points. And then kind of everything else, once you've proven yourself on those pain points, you've built trust with your customer and your prospect, and they'll, you know, They'll believe it when you tell them, hey, those 10 checkbox features that you're used to in MicroStrategy, I'll get them in the next two releases. But like, this is why you're suffering. This is why you want to buy us. Um, that's, that's kind of been an interesting learning from starting a company. Great. Uh, and you guys are hash, uh, hashtag great, Big Data Seacrest. Just want to make sure. <laughs> All right. On that note, we're going to keep things moving. Thank you very much. Thanks, Matt.